State Scoop. We're going to find out about State Scoop today. Bert Lum. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters. And that's Bert Lum. He's the Chief Strategy Officer for Broadband here in Hawaii. A. Welcome to the show, Bert. Hey, thanks, Jay. Always fun to be on uh, Tech. We like to keep you, uh, you know, keep you in joy and laughter, even in these very difficult times. <laughs> So, Bert, what is it like these days being the chief strategy officer on broadband? I mean, after all, broadband is more important in the time of COVID, and it's more important going forward. There's so much technology on the web, you know, that you want to share that with everybody. You don't want a, a digital divide, and you're the man. Well, you know, there's a lot of us uh, involved with this effort, so I think it's a, it's a collaborative, collaborative team effort. The, um, you know, the recognition and Jay, you've been involved with the tech community for as long as I have. And, and I think uh, it's uh, the pandemic made everybody realize that, you know, if we're going to be competitive in the digital economy, we need to make sure that we do something about that. And up until the pandemic, everybody pretty much thought, well, you know, the private sector, they got it. They, they're, you know, they're running uh, uh, connections to homes and, uh, if you got your connection, you're good. So, you know, let, uh, let the guys that don't have it worry about it. And then uh, when, when everybody was, uh, uh, you know, the executive order came out to shelter at home or, or stay at home order, uh, everybody realized, well, okay, so if, if only some of us have it and, and, and now we're having to stay at home, what about the folks that don't have it at home? <laughs> and then that became a real clear indicator of this uh, digital divide. And, and what also became more, um, I think, recognized is the fact that there's a whole digital equity gap. And when I talk about digital equity, I'm not talking about just getting a, a broadband connection. I'm talking about, do you have a computer? <laughs> do you even know how to uh, leverage the technology that is available uh, in terms of you know, digital literacy? And so there's a whole wraparound uh, requirement, I guess, to really take advantage of the technology. And, and I, I sometimes refer to it as the democratization of technology. And if you, you know, if we, we as a uh, community only <clears throat> make it available to people who could <clears throat> afford it or, or have the means to um, uh, understand it, then we're only perpetuating that divide. So I think that I think the uh, we've we've come to that realization, and what has been really supportive of this effort is the fact that the federal government also came to this realization, and the federal government is the one that is uh, uh, putting some you know money where their mouth is, <laughs> and and again you know a lot of this uh, interest, this effort, this attention is because the federal government has has uh, risen to the occasion and, and is making something happen. So I'm really glad you uh, addressed the question of the computers, you know, because broadband alone is not is not enough. Um, you know, you can't you can't live on bread alone. What is it? Uh, anyway, so my, <laughs> my, and yes, and the government uh, has provided, I guess they provided some funding for broadband development and that's your wheelhouse. Um, and have they also provided funding for computer development? You know, uh, what, did, what did Herbert Hoover say? A computer in every bread box? Or words to that effect? Uh, is, uh, do we have money for computers? It's really important. Well, that's a good question. And, and sorry, I can't quote Hoover because that was a little before my time. But, uh, uh, you know, in terms of, of, <laughs> of computers, there are a number of federal programs that have made computers available to uh, the Department of Education. So even, even back when there was the, the CARES money, right? The CARES money provided uh, devices as well as uh, uh, hotspots. And then uh, there came along another program out of the, uh, uh, I think it was Consolidated Appropriations Act called the Emergency Connectivity Fund. And the Emergency Connectivity Fund has been uh, available for the DOE as well as the libraries, and that is primarily for devices and and hotspots. Now, from a you know if you if you are um, 
uh, let's say, not able to afford a computer, uh, you know, there's there's a couple of workarounds. If you're not, you know, if you're if you're uh, not in a DOE or you're not, you know, you're not a student uh, uh, on the receiving end of, of some of the devices that they're handing out. Uh, what what we've done is um, we've supported some of the refurbishing houses here, and one of them is is uh, uh, Hawaiian Hope. And Hawaiian Hope, even before the pandemic, was uh, really active in looking for corporate donations of computers. And once uh, they would get those donations, they would uh, basically bring it up to operating condition. And they were they were already in operating condition, but you know this was to basically wipe the drives and and uh, uh, perhaps you know like maybe put a new drive in there and and put some uh, a camera a, a function a functioning camera. And so the the, the folks at the, um, uh, Hawaiian Hope would make these refurbished computers available. So. What we did in, in DVID was to look at putting together a kind of a pilot program where uh, we set aside some money that would uh, provide about $150 per, per um, computer. And we had some folks that were actually in the field doing digital literacy classes. Uh, so on the, you know, for um, Kupuna, we had, uh, we have uh, folks like Kala Souza and they were, he was uh, out doing some digital literacy classes with the libraries and, and uh, Kelly Withy, who was part of uh, the uh, School of Medicine. She was doing classes on telehealth 101. And oftentimes they would go to class and, you know, the students in the class would say, oh, yeah, this is great, but uh, I don't really, I don't have a computer at home. And so, you know, the, the free computer uh, would, would enable them to at least uh, take something home. So the hardware that, um, we would do. We would work with uh, folks like um, Kala and uh, Kelly, and see how many students in the class needed a computer, and we would make those computers available. And that way, that way they could at least take the computer home. And then there's a in, in combination with that, there's something called the. Uh, this was you know back last year there was the uh, emergency broadband benefit, and this was a program that was rolled out by the Federal Communications Commission. And they provided like a $50 benefit off of your internet bill. So even if you didn't have an internet connection, uh, you could then now, uh, if you qualify, go get an internet connection and get $50 off. So that was a good way of combining, you know, a hardware solution with a, a benefit for getting internet connected. And then um, the the EDB was. Um, limited, I think, by Congress to, I think uh, it was a $2.3 billion across the country. And that ended on uh, December 30th of uh, 2021. But then that immediately transitioned to something called the Affordable Connectivity Program, which was a $30 off. And so it was a, a little less, but uh, it was transitioned over. And then the, the ACP, Affordable Connectivity Program, has uh, an appropriation from Congress about $14.2 billion. So that one actually will last uh, probably over the next, you know, three to four to five years. And so uh, what we're, what we're keeping a close track of is, okay, so as that, as that um, progresses through time, uh, what is the FCC looking at in terms of uh, replacing the, the, the ACP? And when, I think the, the, um, the FCC put out a, a request for comments on, on how to consider revising something called Lifeline or Universal Service. So there's a Universal Service Fund. It's it's kind of an old old fund that was created back in the what 90s. What is Universal Service, and, Bert? Well, so when the um, uh, back when we used to do long distance calling, <laughs> there was a uh, there was a fund that was created that would take a a, a small percentage off of the long distance calling. And that went into something called the Universal Service Fund. And that became a fund that could be used for programs uh, that would support things like Lifeline. And Lifeline was a program to enable um, low-income uh, families to actually get a, 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 dis a heavy discount on their telephone service. So it's primarily around the telephone service. 
but that was back in the you know in the 90s right and lots of lots has changed since then and and if you look at uh, how we do calling now uh it's it's less about long distance and it's more about you know your minutes and you have smartphones and you know you have um uh, a lot of it is, is going over the IT network. So the, the the whole structure of the Universal Service Fund is going to be revamped. So there was a call for comments, and, and uh, we were able to put in some comments for representing some of the feedback that we got here locally uh, from the community. So, again, we're, we're following a lot of these programs and making sure that, you know, there's a, there's some sustainability and continuity as we move, you know, move into the uh, further into the, the 20, the 2020, well, you, get, you know. certainly got to pay attention to that because there are so many of them and I'm, and I'm glad you're there trying to coordinate them and make sure that we get, you know, what we're entitled to get under these various programs, but various is the word. And there's this, that, and the other thing. And, uh, you must be like a paper hanger, uh, trying to track <laughs> them all and, and bring them all to the public. But I, you know, I wonder about, I mean, whether you can handle that, it's not easy. And I wonder, the libraries are important, but I wonder about the 12-year-old out in, say, uh, Waianae, uh, who, uh, you know, understands at some level that he's on the wrong side of the digital divide, um, and he knows he can learn a lot, but he doesn't have a way to learn it, he doesn't have a computer. It's like you need a computer to learn about how you can get a computer, you know? Uh, so, <laughs> so how does he get that? I mean, how easy or hard is it? Um, is there, well, you know, do you have a, a, a phone bank of people who will help him? Um, do you have a way well, that a, he can achieve this? Yeah, there's a combination of solutions to address that exact uh, scenario that you just brought up. So one of the things that uh, I mentioned, I mentioned the, uh, the emergency connectivity fund, and that funds devices. So the Department of Education has a fair amount of um, devices and they there was a, a couple of articles written about uh the money that that the doe got and so they're in the process of of rolling you know the um program out getting hardware uh to the the, the schools via the principals and then the principals identify you know the individual students that would be receiving those and then in in in, in combination with that you have um the uh folks in the uh, curriculum side, and there was a there was a couple of bills. One bill, uh, I think, it was last year or the year before. It was to establish computer science in education. So there is a conscientious effort on the part of the DOE to uh, implement curriculum for students K through 12 to learn about computer science. And we've been we've been in touch with uh, many of those folks about the intersection between computer science and digital literacy. So you have the curriculum, you have the hardware, and then uh, the other thing that uh, we are making sure of is that as as these kids go home and and uh, have a device, uh, they're able to connect to something, and so that's that's the effort that um, combines you know all all three, which is the uh, idea of, of uh, broadband access, uh, hardware and devices, as well as digital literacy. So. The challenge is, you know, these are all programs that have been identified as as means by which we can establish this digital equity. Uh, but it's it's coordinating all of those so that, you know, we can get the you know the access and the devices and the you know literacy classes uh, all to coincide. And and that that is also a challenge too, right? Because um, you've got that the needs pricing issues. It needs a, an organizational structure, and frankly, it needs a state money to tap into existing organizations like DOE and have people, you know, dedicated to working on this. Uh, and so my, my next question to you is, is the state um, funding the things you're talking about? The, you know, the COVID monies from the Fed, but what about the state? The state is, uh, has, you know, it's apparently lush these days, flush. Um, how much are you getting from that? I haven't, I haven't really got much of that lushness. So I'm still uh, working on that. We'll see what happens that as it comes out of this uh, legislative session. The, um, <clears throat> the the broadband digital equity office was established in statute in in the 2021 session, but uh, there was no budget attached to that. So uh, you know, I am 
making it a strong message that you know we would need some money to <laughs> to achieve some of the projects that we are undertaking and uh in this legislative session uh there have been uh you know legislators and and legislative support in the form of policy to uh, get an appropriation for the broadband digital equity office so uh there's a there's a key bill that's uh, moving it it um was introduced by Senator Wakai. These Wakai's, are policy bills, uh, not money bills, though. Well, no, these are these are um, bills that have appropriations attached to them. Oh, good. So, SB twenty seventy six, SB twenty seventy six. That's a uh, a bill that um, helped to put some appropriation into the broadband digital equity office, and so that one is is moving, and it it needs to have uh, one last hearing. Um, uh, it, it went over, it crossed over, went into the House, and now it's just waiting for scheduling with the uh, Finance Committee. Uh, another bill that, you know, um, I think has some potential of of getting some money assigned to it is, it, it started off as a bill, but it didn't, it didn't pass because there was no appropriation. This was to establish some data gathering and mapping capability. And, and so the bill basically died, but then it was kind of, in a way, resurrected through a resolution. And so there's a resolution, it's a SCR, um, you know, Senate Concurrent Resolution 41. And, and uh, that one, you know, moved out of the Senate, it's going over to the House. It, resolutions don't have the, the, the power and the, you know, the, the force of law. And they don't have any money either. Appropriation. Yeah, they don't have any money. So, uh, but, the, but the introducers, um, and this was introduced by Senator uh, Drew Kanuha. Uh, they recognize that, you know, this can't be done without any money. So, you know, I think um, I, I'll leave it to the the magicians to figure out how they put some money into the budget for for this. But um, that's going to need some money. You know what they say. I mean, uh, a state that has adequate cheap energy is going to have a better economy. And you know what they also say is uh, a state that has... Uh, adequate cheap broadband is, is going to have a, a, a better chance at being a, a, a tech state, uh, that is a state with the tech sector. Um, I'm sure you will agree with both of those points. So you and I have been following the, mm, what do you want to call it, the possibility of the development of a robust <laughs> tech sector for 20 years. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I One just more. wonder how you feel, you know, how you feel about the current status and and the and the progress or lack thereof, uh, you know, at, at, at the moment, because everybody talks about, as they always have, uh, diversification of the economy. And the first words out of everybody's mouth when they when they use the D word is, oh, yeah, we have to diversify into the technology sector like everyone else in the country. How are we doing, Bert? Well, you know, uh, I, I I try to remain a um, uh, an optimist. <laughs> you know, I I think uh, like you, having spent you know the last twenty thirty years uh, observing this this uh, uh, progress. You know, there's there's a lot more folks that are in the tech sector. I think that's that's a, a positive thing. Uh, your point about energy, I I think that uh, you know if we could leverage some of our our um, renewable energies uh i think i think geothermal on the big island has a great great opportunity and, and potential uh you know i i'm i'm actually pleasantly surprised by the the uh, involvement that my counterparts on the big island uh in in the county have been in terms of support for broadband as well as uh energy alternative energy resources and I think there's there's potential for uh, something to happen. And I think uh, the the Big Island will be an example of what what could be, um, uh, let's say, uh, an example of what the what the rest of Hawaii could do. Uh, but again, you know, but don't forget Kauai. Take a, Kauai is a is a wonderful example too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, you know there is a, a great opportunity, but you know these things. As as you also well know, it takes a like like a <laughs> takes a long time. It, it's a uh, it's like um, sort of move a mountain. Yeah, well, and, that's, and that brings me to my last point of inquiry with you, Bert. Uh, it's the title of our show: State Scoop Top Fifty Awards. What so Keska say a scoop award 
and what is the top 50 scoop awards and why should we here in Hawaii Ne care about state scoop top 50 awards? Well, you know, uh, Jay, I, I hope you will uh, share the link. I dropped it in the chat. Uh, you know, this is the first time that I've ever been nominated for uh, an award. And, and there's a lot of folks that are on this list. Uh, but there's a couple of things that I, I want to bring uh, attention to. One is, uh, as an individual, um, you know, I'm, I'm nominated as, a, as an innovator. And then, and then the other thing that's uh, also, I think, a key recognition is for something that we've done over the past two years called the Broadband Hui. And the Broadband Hui is a representation of key stakeholders in, the, in, in Hawaii uh, that have a strong interest in broadband and digital equity. And we're both, we're both on this, this list. And of course, this is a, a open list for voting of the public, and, and so anybody who has a list can or has a link can go in and, and vote. I would encourage everybody to vote. And this is a national uh, a national election. Okay, yeah, all yeah, you yeah. guys watching this now or later, <laughs> vote for Bert Lum. There's no question how hard he works and for how long he works and his vision for Hawaii. There's no question he should be elected. Everybody vote as many times as no, just vote once. <laughs> well, they can vote as many times as they want, <laughs> but I appreciate that, Jay, because again, you know, uh, we've done this and we've done this just on our own. And I think uh, there's other national organizations that are recognizing what we have done in Hawaii to, to pull people together and co to collaborate, to try to see if we can move, move the ship collectively. And I think we've uh, been able to uh, move it a little bit. And I think there's a lot more work to be done, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, committed to seeing you know us through all the all the turbulent waters that we're currently you know maneuvering and navigating through and that's the truth so um let's assume everybody watching or who will watch votes for bert lum what happens to you um do you get to go to um you know the nobel prize what happens yeah <laughs> i don't know you know i'm not really uh uh, keen on going anywhere. I mean, if they if they send me a plaque, that's fine. I mean, I'll, I'll put it up somewhere. But I, I think it's just the fact that uh, you know an effort that could be done in Hawaii would get recognized. And and if you know if we can put Hawaii on the map. I mean, we're on the map, but we're not really on the map from a digital economy standpoint. We're not on the map for uh, you know a, a tech sector that's uh, uh, equal to some of our bigger industries in Hawaii. Um, if we can, we can help, you know, the next generation achieve those kinds of goals. I think we've done, we've done good uh, for the effort that we've, you know, committed ourselves to. And, and, you know, Jay and, you know, you and I, we've been, you know, we've been pushing this message for, I don't know how long, but, uh, you know, I think uh, I do feel positive that there are more people in the sector. There's more young innovators, there's entrepreneurs, there's ideas that are being, Percolated and and if we can again close the digital divide, help to achieve digital equity across the entire population, and give everybody the opportunity to rise to their potential and their capabilities, uh, I, I think we've done good and make sure that Hawaii stays connected. You know, Trans-Pacific Fiber Cable coming into Hawaii, we gotta, you know, we gotta make those happen. So a lot of the money that's gonna be flowing to Hawaii by the feds are going to go towards some of this sort of strategic infrastructure, but we are not forgetting all the connectivity that is also required in our rural community. So it's everything from, you know, getting the fat pipes into Hawaii, but distributing that throughout the entire Baina. I mean, you know, it's, it's for everybody. So uh, that's our, that's our goal. That's our uh, uh, target. And, and I'm committed to, you know, making that happen. Yeah, I know you've been working on it really most of your adult life, I think, and so hard <laughs> and so well. So, you know, I think what's interesting is that, uh, let me go back to my 12-year-old, okay? Um, without, uh, you know, if he's on the wrong side of the digital divide, if the digital divide continues, you know, um, he's not going to be Bill Gates. Um, but if he has the chance, and if he, if he has access, uh, broadband and a computer, that will be a, you know, a baseline computer to help him learn and do in the world of computing. 
then gee whiz, he could be a programmer. He could be part of that sector that we are all hoping for. Um, he could be a Bill Gates. He could be an entrepreneur. Uh, he could participate in the, the branding that you're talking about, branding Hawaii as a legitimate tech community um, with kids who learn it in school, with, with entrepreneurs who find money and make companies. Um, and, you know, these days, actually, with broadband, you can participate in communities that go beyond our shores. And we, you and I both know so many people who participate in tech communities around the world, and I'm, I'm not limiting that to the United States either. And I, you know, I hope you're right. sitting down, but one of, one of the software companies that ThinkTech deals with is in Kiev. Kiev, I say, Kiev, uh, because yeah. you know, it's, it's completely global. And so that kid, that 12 year old could be involved in a global movement. He could, you, you say, put Hawaii on the map, but make Hawaii a big player on the, on the map. There's no reason why we can't do that. And, and frankly, you've been, uh, you know, uh, you've been advocating for that actively for 20 years and, and more, and you should get the damn award. Okay, I'm, I'm going on that <laughs> website right now, Bert, and I'm gonna vote for you. You got my vote. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Jay, I really appreciate that. And, and you know, you stay, you stay long enough into this field and you see things like Web 1, Web 2, now we're into Web 3. Uh, the kids are going to come up with the new ideas and the new innovations. And as long as we can enable them to discover new things and create new companies and, and uh, new applications and uh, figure out what, what, you know, what Web 3 is all about. And if we can give the tools to build that, you know, allow them to have that foundation, I think that's that's what we need to do. And that's, uh, you know, I'm feeling like uh, there's already stuff out there, like you know, esports, way beyond me. But I think there's going to be a lot of uh, kids growing up in Hawaii that can really take advantage of that. And we just got to make sure that the foundation is there for them. Yes, indeed. But let me add, uh, uh, you know, it's very provocative what you just said. There's nothing so constant as change itself. <clears throat> and it's not a matter of putting a, a, a computer or a, a, a broadband format um, on, on that 12 year old's desk. You have to keep up. You have to, you know, you have to know what the frontier is. You have to explore and discover the frontier. You have to wrap your arms around the frontier and you have to deliver that to him, him too. There's nothing so constant as change. And so you yep. and, and we and everyone uh, we have to keep up with every, you know, development in the world so that we're right there at the frontier. Don't you agree? Absolutely. It's a, it's a him and a her. I want them all to be able to strive for what, what uh, 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 drives their passion. What we have to do, I think, uh, you know, I guess uh, the, the older generation, <laughs> we have to make sure that we provide the, the kind of the leadership, the example the, uh, the, the positive feedback that uh, indicates to the, the young folks that, hey, this is an opportunity that I think we should, you know, we should uh, take on and, and give them a bit of a roadmap, you know, in, in getting there. And, we, you know, we may, we may not be the, the experts on blockchain and cryptocurrencies and, and uh, things like the metaverse, but if we can show them that uh, this is the, the, the great new frontier and and we've enabled them with the with the foundation to achieve that. I think uh, you know we've helped to I think build a, a more diverse Hawaii and and uh, hopefully eliminate the the digital divide. Yeah, yeah. We 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 can't afford to lose our best and brightest. We have to keep them here, and that's one big way to do that. Uh, Bert Lam, a technology guru. Um, the leader of Bite Mark Cafe on Wednesdays <laughs> on Hawaii Public Radio for many years now, uh, and the, st the strategy chief strategist for broadband in Hawaii, and the soon to be a state scoop top 50 award winner.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.